Hello Daily Drafters and welcome to the Wilds of Eldraine Limited Archetype Guide here on the Daily Draft channel. This video is the second of three Wilds of Eldraine set review videos here on the channel and will cover everything you need to know to prepare for your first drafts of the new set when it releases on MTG Arena on Tuesday, September the 5th. Let's dive in. Now, I won't be going over any of the new or returning mechanics in this video, as I did that earlier this week in part one of my Eldraine set review. If you'd like to review that video so you have an idea of what's going on here today, feel free to check out that with a link in the upper right hand corner visible right now, via a link in the description, or simply checking out the video list on the channel and finding said video. With that out of the way, let's dive into the main event in today's video, the Archetype Guides. I'll now go ahead and run through all 10 color pairs that exist in Wilds of Eldraine, what the decks care about, their themes, some of the key commons and uncommons for the archetype, and even some rares and mythics that can pull you into the deck as well. And we will begin with Red White, which is advertised as a classic aggro deck with a celebration sub-theme. We see red white aggro almost every single set, so let's see if the celebration mechanic can give this deck the tools it needs to succeed, beginning with our signpost uncommon for the deck, Ash Party Crasher, which is a 2 mana tutu with haste that also grows whenever you celebrate, hinting at the deck's theme of aggression and celebration. Now what good would an aggro deck be without aggressively statted creatures and spells? So let's take a look at a few for this deck, beginning with Cheeky House Mouse, which is a 1 mana 2-1 at its base that also has an adventure that can temporarily buff one of your creatures and open up attacks. We also have Monstrous Rage, which effectively gives plus 3 plus 1 in Trample for a single red mana, and the plus 1 plus 1 in Trample portion even sticks around permanently. Embereth Veteran is another 1 mana 2-1 that can cash itself in later in the game to put a young hero roll token on another creature. And the Princess Takes Flight is a Sokka that removes a blocker for two turns and gives you an incredibly good attack during its second chapter, a very aggressively slanted card. Now I mentioned this deck has a celebration sub-theme, so let's take a look at some of the celebration payoffs at common and uncommon, beginning with Grand Ball Guest, which is a 2 mana 2-2 that gets plus 1 plus 1 and trample when you celebrate. Belligerent of the Ball is a 3 mana 3-3 three, three at its base and gives a creature plus 1 plus 0 oh, and menace when you celebrate. Gallant Pie Wielder gets double strike when you celebrate. Armory Mice is a 2 mana 3-1 that becomes a 3-3 three, three when you celebrate. Return Triumphant is a reanimate card that triggers celebration with just one card as roll tokens are also permanents. And Charmed Clothier is a 5 mana 3-3 three, three flyer that makes a roll token as well, which also triggers celebration on just one card. A few rares and mythics that will shine in this archetype include Heart Flame Duelist, which is a 2 mana 3 1 that gives your instants and sorceries lifelink, but also has an adventure that is a 3 mana deal 3, a great value of a card. Godric Cloaked Reveler is a 3 mana 3 3 with haste, which is already great, but if you celebrate, he becomes a 4 4 fire breathing flying dragon, which will surely pack a punch. And Virtue of Loyalty gives you a 2 mana 2 2 Vigilance with its adventure and can then become an enchantment that puts counters on all of your creatures at your end step and untaps them, an insanely snowballing ability. Next up we'll look at Blue White, which gets a very interesting theme that I'm not sure I've ever seen before in Limited, and that is caring about tapping down your opponent's creatures. This theme has the ability to be both a tempo aggro plan or even a bit of a control plan. So let's see the support for this deck, beginning with our signpost uncommon, Sheree of Numbing Depths. That is a 4 mana 2-3 that ETBs and taps and puts a stun counter on a creature and also draws you a card every time you tap an opponent's creature, up to once each turn. Now this is a huge payoff for already doing what this deck wants to do and I've got my eye on this archetype as a result. We will first need to find some spells that tap down your opponent's creatures, so let's begin with Succumb to the Cold, which taps two creatures and puts a stun counter on both of them. Snare Master Sprite can be a 1 mana 1 1 flyer or a 3 mana 1 1 flyer that taps a creature and puts a stun counter on it. Freeze in place taps a creature, puts a stun counter on it, and scries two. And Bitter Chill taps down a creature, locks it down, and can even scry one and draw a card if you pay one mana when it leaves the battlefield. So what are some of the common and uncommon payoffs for getting into this archetype? Well, Threadbind Click is a 4 mana 3-3 three, three flyer that has an adventure that just straight up destroys one of those creatures that you've tapped down. 
Ice Rot Sentry can tap a creature down for 2 mana when it attacks, and also gets plus 2 plus 1 whenever you tap an opponent's creature. And Solitary Sanctuary is a 3 mana enchantment that taps and puts a stun counter on a creature, and puts a plus 1 plus 1 counter on a creature you control whenever you tap an opponent's creature. Now, unfortunately, there aren't many rares or mythics that specifically synergize with this theme, but the most obvious one is Hilda of the Icy Crown, which is just an incredible payoff for this deck. You can easily just make 4-4s, four permanently pump your entire team, or scry 2 and draw a card every single time you tap an untapped creature, assuming you pay 1 generic mana. And that's the only rare that directly synergizes with this deck, so I also chose to highlight Ingenious Prodigy and Werefox Bodyguard as two generically good creatures that will likely slot in nicely into what I think will end up being a bit of a tempo aggro deck here in this format. Now before we hop into our next archetype, here's a quick message from me. Thanks me. Set review season is the perfect time to consider supporting the channel via the Patreon. We have several tiers over at the Daily Draft Patreon with rewards including access to my tier lists, early access to content, and lifetime access to the Daily Drafters Discord server. I'm incredibly proud of the continued work on my tier list, and here's an example of what these tier lists look like uh, from Lord of the Rings. And as you'll see, I use a traditional A through F rating for every single card. I let you know if the card has moved up or down since the last update, and I give you the ability to hover over every single card and get a link to the Scryfall, a uh, clickable link to Scryfall as well. And beginning with Wilds of Eldraine, I will also be ranking every single common and every single uncommon within their own color, as well as every single removal spell in the entire set at common and uncommon, so you have a better idea of how they compare to each other as well. I'm currently working on my Wilds of Eldraine list, as you can see, and I will have this released to patrons in the Centaur Corsa Rewards tier as soon as I'm finished, guaranteed before pre-release weekend, and guaranteed to be updated with my experiences during early access before you head to your pre-release. Now, if $5 is a bit too rich for your blood, we also have three and $1 tiers that come with early access to content and lifetime access to the Discord server, a great place to hang out and discuss all the happenings of a brand new set. If a monetary contribution is not your speed, then a subscription to the channel is always enough. And now, back to the set review content. Next up we have Red Black, which seems to have a couple of themes, but the ones that seem most present to me are Sacrifice and Token Aggro. We see Black Red Sacrifice often, but I think that may be a secondary theme for this archetype here on Eldraine, but let's first take a look at Totenton's Swarm Piper, which is a 3 mana 2-3 that gives you a rat token whenever a non-token creature you control dies, and can also turn those rat tokens into attacking threats by giving them death touch when they attack. These rat tokens can't block either, which gives me the idea that this deck might want to be a little bit more on the aggressive side. Some of the sacrifice energies and payoffs for this deck include Harried Spear Guard, which is a 1 mana 1 1 with haste that dies into one of those rats we talked about. Vampiric Rites is a repeatable sack outlet that can continue to refuel your hand. Lord Skitter's Butcher is a 3 mana 2 3 that either enters with a rat, lets you sacrifice another creature to scry to and draw a card, or gives your whole board menace. And Fairy Dream Thief is a cheap creature that you can sacrifice and exile from your graveyard to draw a card and lose a life. As far as the token aggro synergies in the deck, we have Rat Catcher Trainee, which is a 2 mana 2 1 that has first strike on your turn, but also has an adventure that makes two rats. Voracious Vermin is a 3 mana 2 1 that comes with a rat and grows as other creatures you control die. And Tattered Ratter gives all your rats plus 2 plus 0 oh whenever they become blocked. Some of the rares and mythics to keep an eye out for in this archetype include Lord Skitter himself, which gives you a 1 1 rat every single time you enter combat on your turn. Grave Pact, which synergizes with all of these tiny creatures dying on your side by making your opponents sacrifice creatures as well and Bitter Blossom, which gives you a 1-1 flying fairy at the beginning of your turn at the measly cost of just one life. Next up we have Red Green, which gets a theme that we've seen before, and that is that it cares about creatures with power 4 or greater. Again, we've seen this before, and it hasn't ever quite gotten there as an archetype, but maybe Ruby Daring Tracker can assist in that. Ruby is a 2-mana 1-2 with haste that can tap for either red or green, but also becomes a 3-4-1 attacking if you control a creature with power 4 or greater. 
A nice little mana dork that becomes a relevant attacking creature later in the game, a nice twist on a signpost uncommon. Let's first look at some of the creatures at common and uncommon that have 4 or greater power to get your synergies going, beginning with Agatha's Champion, which is a 5 mana 4 4 trample that can fight a creature if you bargain the spell. Beanstalk Worm is a 5 mana 5 4 with reach that has a mini explore as its adventure without the card draw, obviously. Two Headed Hunter is a 5 mana 5 4 with menace, whose adventure can give a creature a double strike. And Howling Gale Fang is a 4 mana 4 4 with Vigilance that can also have haste if you have a card that's on an adventure. So what are some of the payoffs for having creatures with power 4 or greater in your deck? Well, Garrick's Uprising draws you cards every time a creature with power 4 or greater enters, and gives all your creatures trample. Up the Beanstalk doesn't specifically care about the whole power 4 or greater thing, but does draw you cards whenever you cast spells with mana value 5 or greater, many of which are creatures with power 4 or greater. Picnic Ruiner gets double strike when it attacks if you control a creature with power 4 or greater and has an adventure that can basically assure that you have at least one of those creatures. And Boundary Lands Ranger lets you rummage at the beginning of your combat step if you control a power 4 or greater creature. What are some of the rares and mythics for this ferocious deck? Agatha of the Vile Cauldron has an ability that can grow your whole team, benefits greatly from putting counters on her, and makes activated abilities cheaper. Realm Scorcher Hellkite is just a big fat dragon with a huge text box that's all upside, and who wouldn't want that in their deck? And Gruff Triplets is a card I could include in every single green deck in today's video because of how stupidly powerful this card is. Six mana for three three threes, and when one of them dies, you put three plus one plus one counters on the other two, so now you have two six sixes. And then when one of those dies, you turn the other six six into a 12 12. Oh, and obviously they all have trample, and this is just a rare, not a mythic. Like, excuse me, what? Next up we have Black Green, which we see far too often as a Graveyard Matters deck that never really comes together, but this time, as it was on original Eldraine, Black Green cares about food. We just saw an aggressively slanted food archetype in Lord of the Rings with Green White. This seems to be more of a value-oriented food deck as we take a look at Greta Sweet Tooth Scourge which is a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three that comes with a food token, and you can also pay a green to sack a food and put a counter on a creature, and you can also pay one and a black to sack a food to draw a card and lose a life. A little mana intensive, but powerful value nonetheless. Some of the commons and uncommons that create food include Gingerbread Hunter, which is a 5-mana five 5-5 five five that creates a food when it enters and also has a removal spell as an adventure. Return from the Wilds lets you choose two between making a 1-1 human, making a food, and ramping by finding a basic land from your deck. Sky Beast Tracker is a creature that makes a food every time you cast an expensive spell. Scream Puff, which is just the greatest name and artwork in the entire set, is a 5-mana 4-5 with Death Touch that makes a food whenever it hits your opponent. And the Witch's Vanity kills a small creature, makes a food, and then gives you a Wicked Roll token. Some great value for just two mana. Some of our payoffs for making all of this food include Welcome to Sweet Tooth, which gives you a 1-1, a food, and then counters equal to 1 plus the number of foods you control. Knight of the Sweet's Revenge comes with a food and lets all your food tap for green mana, and later in the game can be used as a big overrun for your whole team. Sweet Tooth Witch comes with a food and lets you sacrifice food to ping your opponent for 2 damage. And Candy Grapple is a removal spell that gets better if you bargain it, and remember, food are tokens that you can sacrifice to the bargain ability. Some rares and mythics that will slot right into this deck include Elvish Archivist, which gets two counters every time an artifact ETBs on your side, of which food are artifacts, and also pays you off for enchantments. Mosswood Dread Knight is just a great value of a card that replaces itself with this adventure half, and can keep coming back and drawing you cards from the graveyard, and Ashiok Wicked Manipulator, because sometimes synergy doesn't matter, and the raw power of a Planeswalker with 102 words in its rules text is probably just enough to win a game of Limited. Next up we have Green White, which is the archetype that cares most about our newest headline mechanic, Roll Tokens. This archetype looks to suit up your creatures with all sorts of rolls to make them bigger and badder when they tussle in battle. 
Let's see how Sir Armand the Redeemer fits into that plan as a 5-mana 4-4 that puts a monster roll token on another creature you control when it ETBs, but also gives every one of your creatures that are enchanted plus 1 plus 1. And if you're building this deck right, that's probably going to be most of them. A few of the commons and uncommons that create roll tokens for this deck include Charmed Clothier, which is a 5-mana 3-3 flyer that creates a royal roll when it enters, Royal Treatment is a combat trick that gives Hexproof and gives that creature a royal roll as well. And Besotted Knight is a 4-mana 3-3 that creates a royal roll as its adventure half. A few of the payoffs for making all of these roll tokens include Tangle Span Lookout, which draws you a card every time an aura enters under your control, and rolls are auras. Graceful Takedown is a removal spell which gets better the more enchanted creatures you control. Red Tooth Vanguard can keep coming back to your hand from the graveyard when enchantments enter under your control. And Knight of Doves gives you a 1-1 flying bird every time an enchantment hits your graveyard. And don't forget that tokens do technically hit the graveyard before vanishing, so this will trigger when your rolls die with your creatures or get bargained away. A few rares and mythics for this deck, and there are plenty that I won't even mention, include Spellbook Vendor, which can give you a sorcerer roll every single turn at the low, low cost of just one mana. A Tale for the Ages makes all of your enchanted creatures get plus two, plus two, and any creature with one of the plus one, plus one rolls will now automatically get plus three, plus three, a huge bonus. And Archon of the Wild Rose might just be the best card in this deck as it makes all of your enchanted creatures 4-4 flyers at the baseline, which will surely end games quickly. Next up we have Blue-Green, which is a deck that is looking to ramp into big, expensive spells. Blue-Green Ramp is a classic limited archetype, so will it be able to work on Eldrain this time around? If it will, Troyon Gutsy Explorer will have to play a part as a 3-mana 1-3 that can tap to add 2 mana that can only be used on spells with mana value 5 or greater, or X spells if that suits your fancy. And if it's later in the game and you've already dumped your hand and don't need the mana, well, he turns into a cheap looter to find some more. Some of the ways that we have to ramp at common and uncommon include Knight of the Sweet's Revenge, which lets all of your food tokens tap for a green mana, Root Rider Fawn is likely the linchpin to this deck as the common mana dork that can tap for green and even fix you in a pinch. And Utopia Sprawl lets a forest that you enchant tap for an additional mana. Some of our ramp payoffs and payoffs for casting expensive spells include Tempest Heart, which is a 4 mana 3-4 with Trample that gets counters every time you cast expensive spells and lets you draw 2 and discard 2 for 2 mana as its adventure. Up the Beanstalk lets you draw a card every time you cast an expensive spell. Sky Beast Tracker gives you a food every time you cast an expensive spell. Stormkeld Vanguard is a 6 mana 6-7 six, that can't be blocked by small creatures that has a naturalized effect as its adventure. And Galvanic Giant lets you tap opponent's creatures when you cast expensive spells and has a very expensive adventure itself at 7 mana which lets you draw 4 cards and then discard 2. Some rares and mythics for this deck include the Goose Mother, as she is an X spell that can scale with the game as you accrue more and more mana, has flying, becomes huge, makes food, and draws cards. Bramble Familiar is a 2 mana 2 2 mana dork that has all kinds of additional bonus text and has an expensive spell as an adventure. And I'm not sure if Omniscience is going to be a good spell in Limited, but my gut says no, but I mean if there's a deck that it would be good in, it's probably this one. Next up we have Blue Black, which gets a couple of themes, but themes that I'm sure will be fan favorites. The two themes this deck will focus around will be Fairy Tribal and Traditional Control. This deck will look to use traditional control elements like counterspells and bounce spells paired with a bunch of flying fairies to close out the game. Obira Dreaming Duelist is a 2 mana 2 2 flash flyer, which is already incredible, but she also pings your opponent every time another fairy enters under your control, a truly great tribal build around. Now, what good would a tribal deck be without creatures of that tribe? So let's start by looking at a few fairies for this deck, beginning with Barrow Naughty, which is a 1 3 flying fairy that has a lifelink if you control another fairy and can pump itself. Snare Master Sprite is a cheap fairy that can also be kicked to tap a creature an opponent controls and put a stun counter on it. Picklock Prankster is a 1-3 fairy with flying and vigilance that can also get a little card advantage with its adventure half. And Into the Fey Court is a sorcery for 5 mana that draws 3 cards and makes a 1-1 fairy. 
Some of the classic control elements of Blue Black this time around include Ego Drain, which is essentially just Thoughtseize without the life loss, but at the cost of also exiling a card from your hand unless you control a fairy, in which case it's just Thoughtseize without the life loss. Taken by Nightmares is the classic great 4-mana removal spell in black. Spell Stutter is a conditional counterspell that gets better with the more fairies you control. Disdainful Stroke is a counterspell that can counter more expensive spells. Ice Out is a counterspell with upside if you're willing to bargain it. And Johan's Stopgap is a bounce spell that also gets better if you're willing to bargain it. Some of the rares and mythics that you should look out for in this deck include Talion's Messenger, which lets you loot when you attack with fairies and grows your fairies as you do. Bitter Blossom is an obvious include in any deck that cares about fairies. And Kindred Discovery might actually be good in this deck, as this is the only tribal blue deck in the format, and this card could draw you a ton of cards in this archetype. Next up we have Blue Red, which is a little bit boring, as it is once again an instance and sorceries deck, but this time it also gets to play around with the most adventures. We see blue red spells all the time, but let's see if the addition of adventures can make this deck any more interesting, starting with our signpost uncommon, Johan Apprentice Sorcerer, which is a 4 mana 2-5 that lets you look at the top of your library at any time, and even lets you cast instants and sorceries from the top of your library. And yes, this means you can cast the adventure half of your adventure permanence from the top as well, but only the adventure half. Surely, some nice additional value. Now, there's always far too many instants and sorceries for me to point out in this section, but I'll name a few, beginning with Torch the Tower, which might just be the best removal spell in the set. It's one mana to deal two to a creature, or three, and scry one if you bargain it, and it exiles. Quick Study has replaced Divination as a strictly better version now at instant speed. Frantic Firebolt is three mana to deal two at instant speed, but gets better and better based on the number of instant sorceries and adventures in your graveyard. Misleading Motes is our instant speed blue removal for the set. Obira's Attendance is a 5 mana 3 4 flyer that has a combat trick as an adventure. And Baluna's Gatekeeper is a 5 mana 6 5 with an adventure that bounces a smaller creature. Now let's check out some of the payoffs for the deck, including Chancellor of Tales, which is a 4 mana 2 3 flyer that also copies every adventure spell that you cast. Mocking Sprite makes all of your instants and sorceries cost one less to cast. Aquatic Alchemist is a 2 mana 1 3 that becomes a 3 3 when you cast a spell and can rebuy a spell from your graveyard to the top of your deck with its adventure. And Frolicking Familiar is a Windrake that gets bigger as you cast spells and has an adventure that can ping something for 1. Some of the rares and mythics that slot right into this deck include Horned Lock Whale, which is a 6 mana 6 6 Ward 2 with Flash that can also remove a creature for just 2 mana with its adventure. Asinine Antics can turn all of your opponent's creatures into 1-1s one for 4 mana, or even at instant speed if you choose to pay 6. And Imidane the Pyrohammer can throw damage at your opponent as you cast burn spells on their creatures. Our last archetype is Black White, and this deck is another sacrifice deck, but with a twist. This deck cares about sacrificing enchantments and tokens using the new bargain mechanic. Let's take a look at Neva Stalked by Nightmares, which is a 4 mana 2 2 creature with Menace that lets you rebuy a creature or enchantment from your graveyard to your hand and also gets bigger and scries as enchantments get put into your graveyard. So ideally, you're sacrificing tokens and bargaining away enchantments to grow Neva and get some value, a nice little synergy. Let's start with the cards that have bargained and can sacrifice things, beginning with High Fey Negotiator, which is a 5 mana 3 5 flyer that can drain your opponent for 3 if you bargain it. Candy Grapple is a great removal spell that gets incredibly good if you bargain it. Back for Seconds is a card that returns two creatures from your graveyard to your hand and can even reanimate one of them if you bargain it. Kellen's Light Blades is a decent conditional removal spell that kills anything if you bargain it. And Archon's Glory is a combat trick that gives flying and lifelink if you bargain it. So what are some of the payoffs for doing all of this sacrificing? Wicked Visitor pings your opponent every time an enchantment hits your yard. Warehouse Tabby makes a rat under the same conditions. Hopeless Nightmare is an outstanding bargain target as it already pinged them for two and made them discard a card. Knight of Doves makes a 1-1 flyer every time an enchantment hits your graveyard. Savior of the Sleeping gets a counter every time an enchantment hits your yard. 
and Cursed Courtier comes with a Cursed Roll, making it a 1-1, but in this deck, that's just another bargain target. Sack the roll, and you're left with a 3-3 lifelink. A few rares and mythics to look out for in this deck include Tangled Colony, which is just a generically good creature that dies into at least a couple of 1-1 rat tokens. Ariette of the Charmed Apple drains your opponent every turn based on your auras and even rewards you for enchanting your opponent's creatures. And Devouring Sugar Maw is a 4-mana 6-6 with Menace and Trample that requires you to basically bargain something every turn if you don't want to tap it, but has an adventure that gives you two bargain targets in a human and a food. Now, I thought I'd add one more topic to this archetype video here at the end, and that is my first impression ranking of the top three commons in each color. This should give you an idea of some of the important cards to look out for in your boosters at your pre-release in the common slot, the slot that will appear most frequently for you. So let's go ahead and start with white and stockpiling celebrant at number three. There's just a lot of synergies that this card can offer you between bouncing creatures with adventures to rebuy the adventure half of the card, or even just bouncing permanents if you're desperate for a scry, and the 3-2 isn't horrible either. At number two, I have Cooped Up. The enchantment-based removal hasn't been great lately, but I think this card has what it takes to be ranked this highly. It's only two mana, enchantments matter in this set, and you can exile the creature in a pinch. I don't see how this card goes wrong. And at number one, I have Slumbering Keep Guard. I'm not confident with this pick at number one, which might insinuate I'm not super high on white at common, which may be true, but these 1 mana 1 1 creatures with upside have always overperformed, and in a set that cares so much about enchantments, I can see this scrying 4 or 5 times over the course of the game and threatening plus 4 plus 4 or greater the majority of the time. In blue, at number 3, I have Misleading Motes. I feel like this kind of card always underperforms, but I just wasn't confident enough to put anything above it at number 3 just yet. I wouldn't be surprised though if this card gets knocked out of the top 3 within the first week once we figure out what the best synergies in the format are. At number 2 I have Diminisher Witch. I seem to like these 3 mana 3 twos with upside so far, and I think bargaining away a token or a food or something to turn an opponent's creature into a 1-1 one -one seems like a pretty good deal to me. I have a feeling you'll include this much more often than you'll cut it. And at number one, I have Johan's Stopgap. Ideally, you're casting this for two most of the time, and if you include it in your deck, you should be doing that more often than not. A bounce spell, even at sorcery speed, that replaces itself by drawing a card is usually performing relatively well lately. In black, at number three, I have Warehouse Tabby. I think this card could spawn an archetype all on its own in Wilds of Eldraine. If you're able to pick up three or more tabbies and really lean into the whole bargain sacrifice theme, this can get out of control quickly. If you have two of these on the battlefield at the same time in bargain and enchantment, you get two rats, and it really only goes up from there. The only reason I don't have it higher is because it won't be great in every deck, but it will be in many of them. At number two, I have Hopeless Nightmare. This card just does so much for one mana. It deals two damage, it makes them discard a card, and then turns on all your bargain cards and even pays you off by letting you scry to when you bargain it away. And in a pinch, you can sack it to itself. This card will be great. And yes, it is boring to include a removal spell at number one, but I have Candy Grapple in the number one spot. Two mana to give minus three minus three is great, and if you have bargain fodder, it basically kills anything for two mana. It's just a great removal spell. In red, at number three, I have Harried Spear Guard. Don't overlook these 1 mana creatures in each of the colors. This is a 1 mana 1-1 one -one with haste that dies into a rat. Now, like I said with white, these cards constantly overperform, and I think this one will too. At number 2, I have Frantic Firebolt. This card is 3 mana for 2 damage at its baseline, and will likely be at least 3 damage a good portion of the time, and 4 plus often as well. And its upside is limitless. 3 mana for 8 damage? Sure. And at number one, I have Torch the Tower. This can't hit players, but one mana deal two is always very playable, and one mana deal three and scry one is excellent if you have the bargain fodder lying around, and I think you will a decent portion of the time, making this card great. Now, I'm least confident with green, but currently at number three, I have Brave the Wilds. The reason for this is because its baseline is one mana, find a basic land, which is just totally fine in basically every green deck, but sometimes you can animate your land as well if you draw this late, which is great modality for this one mana card, 
and the modality pushes it into the top three for me. At number two, I have the green fight spell in Curse of the Werefox. I think this might end up underperforming, but the fact that your creature gets a permanent plus one plus one in trample is very nice. I'd like this a lot more if it were a bite instead of a fight, but you know, what can you do? And maybe my hottest take in these lists, at number one, I have Hamlet Glutton. Now, hear me out. If you're consistently casting this for seven, this is not the best green common. But if you build your deck around it and it costs five more often than not, a five mana six six trample gain three life is just an enormous problem for your opponent. You obviously don't want too many of these in your deck, but I'm sure two would be totally fine. We've seen this expensive creature that gains life constantly overperform, and I hope this one does too. Thanks so much for sticking around until the end of this video. If you are still here, I'm always excited for the release of this archetype guide because I know it will be a very beneficial guide to have all of this information in one place so that you have an easy way to find what you need if you wish to revisit the video throughout the week. Don't forget to tune in next Monday for the release of my Wilds of Eldraine pre-release guide as well. If you enjoyed this content, feel free to share it with a friend or two as there is a decent chance they might as well. If you've already subscribed to the channel, Thanks for being here today, and if you're not, go ahead and click that red subscribe button to stay on top of set review season and have access to consistent, high-quality draft content as soon as the set launches on Arena. Looks like that'll do it for this video, and I'll see you next time here at Daily Draft. Daily Draft.